what I'd like to do is to show you my view of where people came from. And it's very different from where we normally accept. And particularly, this business of eating meat. There's great controversy over eating meat. You know, people say, are humans meant to be vegetarians? Should we be eating meat at all? If you look at the newspapers, you'll find time and time again there are reports saying that eating meat can be bad for you. Well, eating anything in large amounts can be bad for you. But it is interesting to reflect on the way in which animals in general have evolved and developed and specialised. I mean, we've got, as we all know, two essential classes of creatures. You have the carnivores featuring dramatically in the top frame, and you have herbivores, like the cows in the bottom frame, that simply feed on vegetation. Now, of course, everything, at the end of the day, feeds on vegetation. Herbivores eat plants directly, and carnivores eat herbivores that, of course, eat plants to begin with. So all of us are deriving our metabolic energy from the sun. The sun shines on the grass, the grass is grazed. Watch this poor antelope misjudging the direction of which it's running when it tries to get away from the leopard. Ow! Oh, dear. Leopards are curious things. If you travel in Africa, over great swathes of the countryside, you will find leopards for us. There are their little pad footprints left in the dust. But you very rarely see them. However, they always see you. And that is an extraordinary sequence. Sometimes, as in this example, you get the impression that these lions are hunting in gangs, in cohorts, almost as though they have a sort of a plan. You hide over there, keep your head down, and I'll drive the prey towards you. It isn't just, of course, in mammals that we see carnivorous feeding habits. They're abundant amongst species of fish in the sea, and also, of course, in the world of, of reptiles. Reptiles have developed vicious, to our eyes, vicious carnivorous habits, and lay in wait for hapless creatures to come along before they seize them, and just almost devour them whole. Remember, these reptiles can't chew. They can only open and shut their mouths, so they have to rely on gravity and inertia and momentum to try and rip their prey apart. Some reptiles, like chameleons, have the most extraordinary complex systems for catching insects. The tongue, it's not just like a tongue, they often say a chameleon has a sticky tongue. The structural anatomy of the chameleon's tongue is so incredibly complicated. It's almost like a little prehensile mouth on its own part. So where does all of this eating business come from? Is it simply a perversion of higher animals? Well, no, it isn't. Let me take you down the microscope. And here at the bottom, we have an alga, a desmid, shown under time lapse and dividing. But watch this single-celled protozoan above. He sniffs this little paramecium and then wolfs it in. This is a single-celled creature. And yet, in terms of its, as it were, its intent, its decision-making, the way it moves and what it does, it seems almost as well coordinated as a kitten catching a sparrow in your garden. You look inside our cells. And here at the bottom, you can see red blood cells simply carrying oxygen to feed the cells around the body. But watch that white cell in time lapse about chasing those two little black bacteria. And if the bacteria drift to one side, he follows. And if it always remains out of reach, he keeps going, he'll turn sideways until suddenly he can engulf the bacteria and you're saved from an infection. That kind of thing, that's speeded up 30 times, but that kind of thing is happening inside all of you as you sit here now. Your white cells in your throat are patrolling for bacteria you may just have inhaled and are able to capture them and destroy them before you get in, apart from the person coughing over there, which they didn't work quite so well. Vegetarianism has become increasingly popular in recent decades, but it does pose a problem. You cannot become a vegetarian just by giving up meat. Vegetarians tend to run short of a couple of the B vitamins and vitamin B3 as well. They may lack calcium. One of our great sources of calcium is the unnatural intake we have of dairy products. 
they're often quite likely to be low on omega-3, though not uh, omega-6s. They may also run short of iron and of zinc and iodine. So you actually need to refine your diet if you're going to give up meat and not just eat the same food but without the meat. So we come to the essential question. Are humans meant to eat meat in the first place? Well, let's just compare the anatomy of herbivores and carnivores and see where we stand. This is a, a dog's skull, a carnivore skull, and you can see quite clearly that you have large incisors, you have these massive canines, you have these great jagged carnassial teeth which uh, grind and rip and tear, whereas if we compare that with a herbivorous animal, then you have a totally different structure. The incisors work against this horny pad just for tugging grass out of the ground. And they have lots of teeth that rub together, grinding teeth, rather than ripping and shredding teeth. The pattern between the two is different. If you look at the structure of the teeth, they're different. Uh, carnivores don't have an apical foramen, a, a little gap, a root, through which nerves and blood vessels can come. Whereas the herbivores have an absolutely vast opening at the base of their tooth. So if you then compare that with humans, you find that we're actually in a halfway stage. Whereas the carnivores lack that opening at the base of the root, and the herbivores have a big one, we have a small one. We have our eyes on the front of the head, whereas herbivores have their eyes on the side of the head. And we have slightly enlarged canine teeth, though not very. So in terms of looking at the anatomy of the skull and the teeth, you have the distinct impression that we're sort of a halfway house. And it's also true if you look at where the eyes lie on the heads of animals, because as a rule, carnivores have their eyes paired at the front of the head, and herbivores have their eyes on the side of the head. The reason being, of course, that herbivores need to be watching out for predators all the time, whereas carnivores, having to catch their prey, need to have good binocular vision looking ahead. Ours, of course, are in the front, as they are in carnivores. So let's have a look inside the structural anatomy of herbivores and omnivores. This was first done in the 1660s by a man called Nehemiah Gru. He published it in his book, or an appendix to a larger book in 1681, called The Comparative Anatomy of Stomachs and Guts. What a wonderfully vivid title that is for a book. He was the first person to do it. And he, he had some wonderful etchings, schematic etchings, of the intestinal structure of, of carnivores and of herbivores. And these are carnivores. On the right, you can see you have the stomach at the top and the guts of a fox. And turn the page and you find those are carnivores. This is a, a herbivore. And so here we have a herbivorous stomach and guts. And at once you notice this great vast curved structure, this convoluted structure. That, of course, is the appendix. And he noticed that herbivores have a huge appendix and carnivores have no appendix at all. But humans, we have a little one. So wherever you look, you get the impression that we're actually meant to be omnivores. And the only way in which you can try and get a handle on how we evolve to eat is if we go back to people who live closer to the traditional ways. And many years ago, I was able to go to West Africa and to see a little of how people eat there. Interestingly enough, the women in the Gambia may often have a dozen children. They don't ever take dairy produce, which would seem to limit the amount of calcium that they take in. And yet, they never get osteoporosis, and they don't suffer from fractures of the femur as we do in the West. It may be because they eat a lot of calcium-rich leaves. It also may be because, of course, they live very industrious, active, working lives. And so they're building up the structure of strong bone. That may be the reason. Um, I, in more recent years, I've been able to speak to the Indians from Colombia. And you find similar peoples up in the Amazon, living a life that is so much closer to where we used to be. Go out into Southeast Asia and you find these highly civilized people whose grandparents and great-grandparents were Stone Age people living in the jungle. The rate at which Southeast Asia has mushroomed into the modern era is really quite extraordinary. And the chap on the right there, he had a, 
a great grandfather still living in the jungle who had a collection of shrunken heads. And he said to me, yes, he has uh, 21 heads. 19 of them were Japanese. They did terrible things to us in the war, so when we caught them, we did terrible things to them, and he kept their heads. And I said, to the other two? He said, looking nervously to one side, he said, oh, they are more recent, I think. There was a case some years ago where in Southeast Asia, a lot of dissidents, political dissidents, were rounded up in a games, an athletic stadium, and put to death. And everybody said it was a public, public execution. What they didn't say was, no, they were all beheaded. And in fact, this was the headhunting tradition, still alive and well in our era. If you go to the Amazon and even to Central America, you will find people to this day still using dugout canoes of the kind we learned about in school as being typical of the Stone Age. They still are with us to this day. And by looking at these people, we can get some impression of how they still have some resonances of the earliest ways in which humans got their food. As this BBC programme from the Amazon show. Stay in the forest, hunting and trapping, as change gradually engulfs them. But for now, these isolated groups still live in relative harmony with their environment. Although predominantly still hunter-gatherers, the Babongo have some shifting agriculture. The women grow maize, manioc and potatoes in small patches cleared from the forest. They forage for crabs, a real delicacy, and smoke armadillos from their burrows. The men are master craftsmen. Jean-Claude Mombe shows me how they trap small game. Wire is now used instead of rattan. You can see it's ingenious, deadly and horrible, but ingenious nonetheless. Um, what we have is um, the snare's under tension and it's caught on a little stick. And these slats here are fixed this side, but loose the far end. So as that goes down, you see it suddenly slips out. Then that enables the snare to come free and it will capture the animal. And the reason it's, it comes in tension like that is so that the animal hasn't got anywhere to, to uh, grapple with the ground, so it can't, it can't bite itself free. It's just, um, it's just been held there and it's a pretty nasty, slow death by suffocation. I'm enjoying my stay here immensely. Life is obviously tough, but the forest seems to provide almost everything that the village needs. And the people of Makoko undoubtedly have something that we have lost in our society, time for each other. Traditional hunter-gatherer people often have to work just three to four hours a day to satisfy their basic needs. The rest of the time is spent just hanging out. They play with their children, groom each other, tell stories, smoke and sleep. And when there is something to celebrate, the whole community celebrates together. Behind the smiles, I'm nervous. I've been here two weeks now, and the Bruti initiation is playing on my mind. Iboga is a powerful, psychoactive drug that will send me on a long and painful journey inside myself. The more I think about it, the more scared I become. We've all got hidden little bits. That, that, that there's something about us. None of us are perfect. And you know, whether it's that, that you have a, a, a big problem with your family over the years or whether it's that you know that you've, that you've you know, upset people and maybe even not really been that remorseful about it. I've, you know, I've broken hearts and I've, you know, and I've, I know in the past I've, I've kind of done some pretty nasty things. Now, the whole point of a subconscious in many ways is to, to like, stick that somewhere and kind of forget about it so you can get on with your life. And the thought of going there and knocking on doors and opening them up and 
and seeing what you're really like, even though you think you're nice. No, actually, let's take a deep look, Bruce. Let's check you out. Let's really see. Are you so nice? Are you as nice as you say? It's just a few words. Are you? You know, is this true? Imagine what that must be like. And some years ago, we made a programme for Channel 5 TV, which would put a light-hearted look at Stone Age people. Since man first climbed from the primordial ooze, science has been his friend. Millions of years ago, the ugly had ways of blinding women to their face. Power can certainly itself act as such a strong attractant to a woman as to completely override any ugliness or physical drawback. Power, at the end of the day, has always seemed probably since mankind first evolved, to be the most important factor of all. But power, of course, is what Stone Age people originally didn't have. Uh, once men were becoming uh, more adept at making things and human society was beginning to develop, then, of course, you had all sorts of ingenious devices, like these very cleverly made barbed weapons that we used by our predecessors. But, of course, we're left with a problem. It is now accepted that it was a meat diet that gave us the intense protein intake that allowed our brains to evolve to the extent to which we see today. But of course, that doesn't really work, does it? Because it's only once you've got a clever brain that you can start making things like this to catch the animals that you needed to eat to develop the brain in the first place. And that was always the conundrum that was in my mind. The notion of the hunter-gatherer seemed to me to be impractical. Once you had developed into modern homo sapiens, once we had become modern people, you could see how it could happen. But how did we get there? We just didn't seem to be very well equipped. And yet you see resonances all the time, elsewhere in the animal kingdom, of the mechanisms on which we pride ourselves as making us human. Go and look at chimpanzees, for example, in the wild. And there you will see how very like humans in so many ways they are. There was outrage, of course, when Darwin's books were taken to say that humans had descended from monkeys. That, of course, isn't the case. Humans and monkeys both descended from a given common ancestor, is how we would argue it, and how Darwin would have argued it too. And it is simply the question that that humans develop this very large brain, whereas other creatures didn't. But time and time again, when you look at the society of apes, and even monkeys, you see these strong resonances. I mean, that almost looks like a man dressed in a monkey suit. Here is an ape that is clever enough, ingenious enough, to have decided to use a tool to extract its food. We always think that mastery of in the environment is what makes us human, but it isn't true. There are single-celled amoebae that can make a little stone home for themselves out of sand grains. There are birds, like shrikes, that will pick acacia thorns and use them to wheedle grubs out from deep within the bark. And in ape society, time and time again, you not only see civilised groups of a self-supportive community, as you might call them, but you see them developing techniques to actually extract food by beating open nuts on a log with, in essence, a tool that they have made. You know yourselves, I'm sure, that crows will sometimes pick up shellfish, crabs, fly up high and drop them on the rocky shore in order to break them asunder. We're not the only ones who use tools. It's quite abundant in the animal world. And when we look at these apes, we can only marvel at the ingenuity that they show. Not only that, but curiosity too. Here is an ape which is just dabbling in the water, purely to see the effects of the light and the dappling, just doing it for enjoyment. And what about this one? With a broken coconut, leaning down and languidly using it as a drinking cup to lift water from the river and sip it just as we might do if we were out of the So, where do you draw the line? Well, if you go back several million years, you come to creatures like Ospropithecus, 
which is a sort of a halfway house between apes and men. This is more than three million years ago. Homo, our genus, not, not Homo sapiens, our species, but Homo, our genus, appears about two million years ago. But that evolutionary process rubs in the paradox I mentioned earlier, because as humans are developing, they're going from being very hairy to being relatively hairless. They're going from having large and powerful teeth to having smaller, less impressive ones. They're going from a strong physique to a weaker physique. From having very high levels of immunity to having much lower levels of natural immunity. From being enormously agile to not being half so agile. I mean, we are very ill-equipped to go out and run across the deserts or the plains, the scrub, the savanna, and go and catch our own prey. And instead of being fearless and almost thoughtless for the future or for consequences of their actions, people are developing to evolve into a far more thoughtful and considered and logical way of behaving. All of these are great if you're going to be civilized and come on a cruise ship, but they're no good at all if you're going to live in the wild. And so you're left with this great paradox. How on earth did it happen? Well, a number of movies have, in recent years, set out to try and encapsulate the paradox between modern man and our early antecedents. And of course, the most memorable one must surely be Stanley Kubrick's 2001. symbolism of this sort of frustrated banging away at a skeleton, at a skull, whilst you see the tape here in the background being intercut and falling down. It makes you realize the frustration that a pre-human ape must have had, because here he is trying to evolve into humanity, but, but dreaming of the skill you need to bring down your prey. And it was also very well articulated, I thought, by that great transvestite comic, Eddie Izzard. Five million years ago, and that, I think, is the point where we started to walk erect. And I think it must have been a gradual period. I don't think we could have just gone... <laughs> oh, this is better. <laughs> I don't know why we didn't do this a long time ago. Steve, Jeffrey, come on, try this. I can see clearly now. The rain has gone. I can see all lobsters in my way. <laughs> it really gets interesting around tool time. Tool time is the uh, Stone Age. That's when it kicks off, Stone Age. Before the Stone Age, no stones, no tools. Hunting was bizarre. Come on, there's a bison. Come on, lads. <laughs> Will you die, sir? Die, I tell you. You're in our territory. I peed and pooed all around here. I marked my territory quite clearly. <laughs> well, ah. 
Will you die? So could you possibly? I, you could feed a family for nine years. <laughs> Don't you look at me with those big eyes, those big cow eyes. <laughs> this could take hours. <laughs> Bigger in hell. Come on, where are you? How can you be late? It's the Stone Age. There's nothing to be late in the Stone Age for. Bastards. <laughs> oh, that is much better. <laughs> Did you see that? Yeah, there's come running up. So I picked up a stone, I hit the bison. He's just, he's gone, he's dead. This is brilliant, Jeff. This could be the beginning of an age. Well, that's what I was thinking. I, uh, provisionally, I've entitled it the, the Age of Big Things Falling Over because they're hit by small things of a much denser material. <laughs> no, just, just Stone Age. Stone Age, yes! You're always better than me than that, weren't you? And it does pose that essential conundrum. How, when you hadn't evolved into Stone Age humans, how could you do it? And in fact, it is remarkable, if you look at the skeletal remains, it's quite remarkable how far back you can go in history, much further than you'd expect, and find the marks of stone on bones. And I summarise these in a lecture when I first announced this theory of mine two years ago in the United States. And these are the examples I showed them. This, for example, comes from Cheddar Gorge, from Kent's Cavern in Goss Cage, and a team at Oxford University have examined this. This is the end of a uh, human form, it's found there. And it's been radiocarbon dated at 9,000 years old. If we look closely, you can see the marks, they're parallel cuts. This was discovered by William Pengelly in 1866. It's only recently been looked at, but there are parallel cuts which quite clearly show humans cutting meat away from the bones. Well, shall we step back a little further? go a further 20,000 years and we come back to the Ukraine, a country I greatly enjoyed visiting. This is 32,000 years ago and this is actually part of the human skull in the ear and it suggests of course that it may be cannibalism and a lot of people these days say these stories of cannibalism have been largely invented by the West in order to paint primitive peoples in a bad light. Complete Coswell, cannibalism has existed and flourished throughout most of mankind's history. You can crank it back even further than that. A hundred thousand years ago, from the Rhone River, clear parallel cuts on human bones and also the bones of deer found in association in the same cave. Goes back a long way, doesn't it? This is from a cave in the Sala de los Huesos in Spain and shows cuts from 160,000 years ago. And I did think to myself how interesting they were. But then I found this one. This is from Dika in Ethiopia. This is from 3,390,000 years ago. This is from Australopithecus. This is far and away the most ancient sign of cuts made on bone. It does show that people have been cutting meat from bones. No evidence here of puncture wounds. These aren't spears going in. These are people using stones to, to scrape the flesh from the bones of creatures. Now, I find that particularly interesting. This suggests that they were using stones, not, as any is our joke, to bring down their prey, but far sooner our antecedents were using stones, stone tools, to cut the flesh from already dead creatures. But how could that be? You didn't run around and wait until something dropped dead of old age and then leap upon it. No. I felt, ladies and gentlemen, that what we were almost certainly doing was uneasily coexisting with wolves. And we were allowing packs of wolves to bring down prey, and then we, or our antecedents, would take meat from victims hunted by the pack of wolves. We were bright enough to do that, but not agile enough to hunt in the first place, as of course the wolves were. And so this was published two years ago as a new theory on human origins. And the key passage just drew attention to what seems to me to be the obvious conundrum. 
that humans are ill-equipped to capture the meat that they needed, these early humans. And until they had reached that stage, they couldn't move on to higher levels of men mental sophistication. So these early communities would have discovered how to scavenge meat from wolves, just as their brain was set to evolve its massive extra capacity. The need to nourish the brain led to the widespread introduction of the scavenging behavior. And the new food supply potentiated the consequential increase in our mental organ and the power of the brain. And each fed the other, so it was the perfect surgery. So that was my view. And there are occasions, of course, when people have drawn attention to the ancient lineage of wolves and humans running together. I quite like this cartoon. And leave it, Arnold. Let them in and they'll want to come in every time. This is how we have a subconscious awareness that wolves and cavemen may have in some way coexisted. Now, it's, it's a nice theory, and it works very well, but theories are much better if you've got evidence to support them. And of course, at the time of writing the article, I didn't have any practical evidence. And I had a phone call from a friend who said, the BBC had just put out a programme which has an example of exactly what you're saying. It shows Kenyans driving lions off once they brought down their prey and using their meat. Apparently, he said, it's an extremely ancient behavior. So I made contact with the bee, and this indeed is what they had brought us. How do mere humans without fangs or claws who can't outrun a wildebeest get a meal around here? Rakita uses brains and teamwork. His plan is to let the lions kill the wildebeest, then he'll steal their dinner from right under their noses. His two friends are essential. Lions aren't easily intimidated. First, Rakita must find the tracks of a lion pride on the hunt. At 65, he's a veteran hunter and takes the lead. They must watch their backs. This is man-eater territory. Signs point to a fresh kill nearby. Rakita's been attacked by lions before. He knows this could end badly. They're up against 15 hungry lions. But if they act as one, they might just intimidate the lions and push them off their kill. They make their move. Self-confidence is everything. This is the ultimate face-off. Suddenly, the lions back off. A 
<laughs> Rakita has just minutes before the lions realize it's a bluff. In a matter of seconds, he butchers the haunch of the wildebeest and they beat a hasty retreat. <laughs> What a fantastic example. With lions, not wolves, it is exactly what it is that I postulated. And I felt so happy when I saw it. And the story that the BBC have told in their wonderful documentary, how, how the hunters see the footprints and then hear the telltale sign of the hyena calling, which leads them to where the kill might be. Uh, except it didn't actually happen like that. The kill was found by the BBC and their Land Rover, who told the hunters where to go and get it, because, in fact, the BBC told the story in a slightly different way in their Human Planet programme. And you may find the contrast quite amusing. The very first story in the Human Planet's Grassland program is a filming first. We went to Kenya to cover an incredible practice that is still carried out by the Dorobo tribe. These people steal fresh meat from the mouths of hungry lions. We all know about human hunters, but very few people know about human scavengers. This sequence was incredibly difficult to film. Although it's been going on for thousands of years, with the advances of the modern world, the practice is starting to die out. So today, only a few Dorobos still gather food in this remarkable way. Lions hunt at night, but it's too dangerous to approach lions when it's dark. So the Dorobo must find a pride who still have a fresh kill. This can take weeks, and we only had a few days in the field. We knew we were up against it. The whole production team worked day and night to help the Dorobo find a lion pride with a fresh kill they could risk stealing meat from. When we found our pride, we were really worried. It was huge, with over 15 hungry lions, with large males and females protecting young. Dorobo were totally cool. The three guys psyched themselves up and boldly walked into the lions while they were feeding on the wildebeest. It's basically a huge bluff. They take a gamble that the lions will be startled and frightened off, just long enough for them to cut a huge amount of fresh meat from the kill. The bluff worked. We were all so pleased we had captured and recorded this story for posterity. And the Dorobo were proud we'd been able to film something that is such an important tradition in their lives. Oh, I do like that. No, I'm afraid they weren't following the spur and listening to the telltale signs of the jungle that would give the game away. The BBC production team and their Land Rovers had gone and found the lions and told them where to go so they could film them. Um, it is interesting when you look twice at something how it doesn't always turn out to be the way that on television it had first appeared. But nonetheless, there is a great example of exactly the kind of behaviour that I had postulated. And just a month ago, I had another one which came from this BBC programme many of you may have seen about the mammoths in Siberia. It is like unwrapping an ancient mummy. Yeah. It yeah. is an ancient mummy. It's an ancient mummy, sure. The chunk. It's a chunk. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, uh, uh, it's oh, my it's goodness. Just... That's amazing. Yeah, this blonde hair, yeah? That fur is really long. From its size, it looks as though this mammoth was about three or four years old when it died. After thousands of years lying frozen in the ground, it's twisted and contorted. Now lying on its back, its head is flopped to one side and its legs stick up in the air. Its foot pads and thick strawberry blonde hair are exquisitely preserved. I'm jealous, he has much more hair than me. 
Isn't it hard to believe that this is something which died so long ago? Yeah, I mean, no. it doesn't look like an animal which has been dead for thousands and yeah. thousands of no, years, no, no, an no. animal from the Ice Age. Yeah. Interestingly enough, the remains of that mummified mammoth showed signs of animal attack, but also signs of parts of the body having been cut away by sharp stones by humans. And a month ago today, Daniel Wright of the United States made contact with the authorities and he said, I believe that what is happening, my interpretation is that these people were actually not hunting mammoths themselves because they weren't able to. He said, I believe what they were doing was scavenging mammoths that had already been hunted by Asiatic lions. It is again early human societies using predatory animals to bring down the food that they themselves then need. So we have two examples, one of the very current of exactly the mechanism that I put forward. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to leave you with the thought that no, the hunter-gatherer only makes sense once humans have evolved to the relatively high level of sophistication that we see in modern humankind. That the hunter-gatherer couldn't have existed until pre-humans had already found a way of getting meat before they were intelligent enough to be hunters and trappers. They were actually human opportunists rather than hunter-gatherers. That essential stage links us with the apes and has never been articulated before. And so there we have it. It also explains a number of things. It explains, of course, why human society and dogs have such a close and intimate interrelationship. It probably goes back millions of years when wolves uneasily cohabited with humans and from that came dogs. You may think, well, what about cats? The ancient Egyptians used to use cats as hunting animals too. They don't use it anymore, but then they did. So it all ties together beautifully. So there we have a new model, ladies and gentlemen, of opportunistic scavengers rather than hunter gatherers. A crucial stage of human development, and one that it has given me very much pleasure to look into in the past. I shall be looking into it much more closely, as I'm sure you can imagine, in the future. And this is the first time I've spoken on it to an open public audience. It's been a very great pleasure to do so, and I hope you found this story interesting. I leave that thought with you, ladies and gentlemen. The hunter-gatherer was not the crucial part. It was the human opportunist, the pre-human scavenger. That is where our current development came from. And I'm astonished that nobody ever thought of it before. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed.